please welcome Managing Director of Education for the Kresge Foundation, William Moses. Uh, first, I want to thank all of you for joining us today in the pre-conference uh, here at Mackinac, but I especially want to thank the Detroit Regional Chamber, especially Greg Handel and Melanie uh, Devlin for all the hard work they've done to putting together this session and this time and the, the work they do every day to promote talent in Metro Detroit. And of course, Sandy Barua uh, for his leadership and vision on this issue here in uh, Michigan and also, of course, in Southeast Michigan. Kresge is pleased to support the Detroit Chamber and Detroit Drives Degrees and is delighted to be part of this session at Mackinac this year on the business case for prioritizing talent development. Now you may know Kresge best for our work in supporting the city of Detroit, but the education team promotes post-secondary access and success for low-income, first-generation, underrepresented students across the United States and overseas. And we're seeing some really amazing things in cities as different as Los Angeles or as in Austin, Texas, and in states like Tennessee. Uh, indeed, uh, former uh, Tennessee Governor Bill Haslam helped really develop the Tennessee promise. Um, and he, he really reset the dialogue nationally about what it means to improve talent and enhance talent in a place. And um, he really made this idea of college universally accessible, uh, really remarkable, and really put a light on it. Um, I couldn't be more thrilled to, to have uh, Emily House of Tennessee among the panelists we're going to have with us today. And while Tennessee is one of the national leaders, it is by no means alone in its success. And we've seen really wonderful improvements in post-secondary access and success uh, across the country. If you go to the Lumina Foundation's A Stronger Nation report, you'll see that um, in 2014, when Bill Haslam said, let's make uh, the Tennessee promise a reality, the, um, the national rate of attainment was 45.3%. That is, 45.3% of all adults had some kind of uh, post-secondary credential. In that same year, when Governor Haslam did that, the state of Tennessee was at 39.3%. Michigan was at 43.3, so we we're four percentage points higher. Now, the good news is that as of 2017, we're all up. So the national rate is now 47.6, so we're almost at 48%, and both Michigan and Tennessee have seen increases. But this is really interesting. Um, we are now at 45%, have some kind of post-secondary credential here in uh, Michigan. And that's up 1.7 percentage points. And we've seen not only some great work by the chamber and also by others, we've, the state has invested in college access through the Michigan College Access Network. So we've seen some great things. But this is the kicker. Tennessee in that same period, using Tennessee Promise and some newer vehicles designed to help older adults come back to college, has seen their attainment rate go to 42.7 percent. They went up 3.4 percentage points in the same period that we went up 1.7. They're doing, they're, they're at a, they're twice the clip that we are. And so what I want to find out from Emily is how they do that and how we can do that too. Uh, because it really is quite remarkable. And you know, this idea that the competition for a better, uh, stronger workforce is getting tougher every year. We had a very good lesson last year from Amazon that said that Detroit was actually a pretty competitive city for a second headquarters, but what we lacked were two things. The talent that they needed to do the work and a good public transit system. And it's not just about attracting new business or retaining new business, it's also about weathering those tough economic times. I don't need to tell anybody in this room how, how tough we had it during the last recession. The places, though, that had higher college attainment rates and more diversified economies did much better in that recession than we did. And so these are the kind of things we need to do by focusing on this kind of talent development of our own people uh, so that we're ready for the next recession and we're ready to attract the kind of business and retain the kind of business we want. So we're very excited by the leadership that the chamber has taken in this area, individual colleges and nonprofits have taken it, and businesses. Um, and what they're doing, whether it's um, Comcast or it's your business or somebody else's, this is something that we think is critically important. Post-secondary credentials are what business says it wants in its employees today. It's also what families and students want so they can all prosper in the 21st century. And this is a solvable challenge. Tennessee has shown us that you can start to change policies and you can have real demonstrable positive results in just a couple of years. So I want to thank all of you for joining us and I look forward to some great discussions. Thank you.
Please welcome Vice President of Education and Talent at the Detroit Regional Chamber, Greg Handel, and Chairman of Butzel Long, Richard Russell. So good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Um, before we start, I want to acknowledge Bill Moses and the Kresge Foundation for giving us, creating a national platform. He talked about cities like Los Angeles and Austin. Those are places that we've learned from. So some of the things that we're going to talk about today are things that we've imported from those other regions, from those other places, based on the national network that Kresge has helped establish. So I am Greg Handel. I am the Vice President for Education and Talent for the Detroit Regional Chamber here with my colleague uh, Dick Rassel, who is our co-chair for Detroit Drives Degrees. So the chamber yeah. is the anchor institution for Detroit Drives Degrees. Detroit Drives Degrees is a multi-sector partnership that includes leaders from business, K-12 education, higher education, business, philanthropy, and the broader community, all with the goal of increasing education attainment across Southeast Michigan, with a special focus on reducing racial and income disparities in education. So we look forward to, we want to share a little bit of data that will set up uh, a, a, a conversation we're going to have in a little while with some background data on our talent and skills gaps and education attainment figures as they stand right now in Southeast Michigan. So Dick? So it, Bill has really set the stage as Greg has, but the, what is the talent gap that we are facing here in our region um, and why are we at it? Maybe historically, looking back, it was very easy uh, 25, 30 years ago to earn an above average income nationally uh, without a degree. And so there was very little emphasis historically in Michigan in post-secondary attainment. Those days have come and gone. That ship has sailed. And it has left us far behind in our efforts to really further upscale our homegrown talent in Michigan. And that is the challenge that we're facing. So we've been at it uh, under the rubric of Detroit Drives Degrees for several years, and uh, we are working on moving the needle forward. And incrementally, we've had some victories, as Bill has indicated, but uh, we have much to do. So here's the, here's the, here's the challenge. Business tells us their number one problem is lack of talent. This number really shocked me. 351,000 live job postings in Michigan last month. That's roughly 3.5% of our population. 351,000 open jobs. And many of them, the majority of them indeed, required some post-secondary education. So how do we attack this? Michigan is behind, uh, and uh, we are in moving forward trying to attack this problem. Where we stand right now, and this slide should have been updated, but Bill is correct, the, we stand at 45% now of post-secondary uh, achievement. Um, but better performing states, Massachusetts, for instance, uh, are at 56%. That is a huge gap. It's not only a huge gap in the number of bachelor degrees, but it is a huge gap in economic income. So that translates to roughly $14,000 per capita between Massachusetts and Michigan in family income. That's a huge gap and one that needs to be attacked. Go ahead and go. So one thing we want to preface this conversation, too often when we talk about higher education and education attainment, we get into like an unproductive side conversation about what's more important, four-year degrees, skilled trades, other kinds of high-value certificates. So for the rest of, of this conversation this afternoon, just know that when we talk about attainment, when we talk about higher education, we're referring to the whole gamut, the whole landscape. So in our view, and you'll see some data, I think, that kind of bear this out, we need more skilled trades. We need more skilled certificates. We need more associate degrees. We need more bachelor's and advanced degrees. So just to understand, we want to, we're about this being an and conversation rather than an or conversation. Go to the next slide. 
So our goal um, for Detroit Drive is twofold here. So one, uh, to get to 60% attainment, we're thrilled that the governor has, uh, has, has taken this on as the state's goal. So we're, we feel really good about that. Again, that's more of all kinds of credentials. So in raw numbers, what we have to do to meet that target is we would need to add an additional 392,000 credentials in Southeast Michigan beyond what we, uh, the pace that we're already set for. So if we didn't do anything, if we had no interventions and just grew at the rate we've been doing, we had about another 140,000 credentials. What we need to do is, in addition to that 140, we need to add 392 to get to the 60%. And the other thing we want to do is part of this effort, in fact, the only way you get to 60% is to reduce the racial gap in uh, degree attainment and also the income gap. So for instance, right now, um, there's national data from the Gates Foundation that shows about 80% of high-income students who graduate high school end up with a credential within six years of graduation. For low-income students, that number is 9%. So we're run out of middle-income and higher-income students to send through some kind of post-secondary track. The only way we get to 60% meet our goal is if we help those populations that aren't currently being well-served by our system. So our coalition, the D3 coalition, uh, has been attacking this problem on several levels. Uh, the coalition is obviously K through 12, the higher education community, and the business community. And this session today is really aimed more at the business community and what all you can do to uh, provide uh, for future leadership and support for this effort. Dollars and cents wise, uh, this chart illustrates what the gap is. Um, this is the 15 cities in the United States, the 15 metros with the highest educational attainment uh, on one side of this chart and also the income that derives from that. Also on this chart are Detroit and Grand Rapids. And as you can see, we're on the chart but barely in the game. These are big barriers to economic prosperity. And as I've already alluded to, every change of 1% in bachelor degree attainment in a region is about $1,200 per capita. So just translate that to statewide income, to tax base, to everything else that you can imagine. It would be a huge impetus, but we need to catch up and we need to change the attitude in the state about post-secondary attainment. So improving, we are working with two cohorts. Now when we talk about post-secondary educational attainment, it's very easy to think that we're just talking about high school students. That's not the case. In fact, the biggest opportunity in the state of Michigan is those who have, uh, are in the adult world who have some college but no degree, some classwork, some credits, but no degree. We will not reach our 60% goal if we do not very much and very deeply tap into that large pool of talent. And it makes sense for the business world to try to tap into that talent. So we are working with two cohorts here and we have separate tracks for each, but there are elements that are similar to both. Number one, access to post-secondary education. For the high school students, it's everything from FAFSA, counseling, and so on. For the post, the, those already en uh, enter in the business world who have some degree, it may be your HR department and pointing out that, in fact, your organization actually does support post-secondary education, both in time, maybe in financially, or it may be in flexible scheduling, but both of those are critical. Then, once we have the students into the programs, we are working on ways to provide better counseling, to provide better cohorts to work with, and so on, so that we improve the success rates because our persistence rates uh, are not as good as we will hear, for instance, uh, as they are in Tennessee. So those two pillars are there. 
We graduate them. We are still losing too many of the students that we graduate in Michigan. And the key to retaining them, frankly, is providing those jobs that provide family level educational support and financial support that it, there really is a living situation in Michigan. We're doing a better job on that one, but that one is key to retaining talent. Greg? Sure, so the next slide. So this slide really shows that So the good news is uh, the, the class of 2010 for all of Metro Detroit, this is not a city of Detroit slide, this is a regional slide. So the good news is 83% graduated on some kind of secondary education. But as you can see there, 40% had completed a degree within uh, six years. And you know clearly you see the biggest group are folks who didn't complete, and only 1% ended up with a certificate. So if you go back to the slide that Dick showed where the, the, the relationship between per capita income and bachelor degree attainment. In case that there's too many bachelor's degrees, right? Their per capita income goes up as more bachelor's degrees. It's pretty hard to make a case that we have too many people in skilled trades and certificates. So we can't reach economic prosperity until we address that big orange bubble right there on the, on the far side of the pie chart. So next slide. So what can we do to drive change, to, to shrink that part? pie where we have students that are dropping out. Well, one of the things that we're doing is looking, again, around the rest of the country, um, Cleveland, Chicago, some other regions, uh, Los Angeles have developed educational compacts where they develop a st strategic roadmap with their partners who all make specific commitments to improve outcomes in various areas. So, and then each year. So the next slide. So we have partners who are working on plans right now, and they've made specific commitments. And we have examples blown up in the back of the room. You can see them on the easels there. But we have partners that are making specific commitments to make changes in these metrics to also improve post-secondary access by improving SAT scores, helping more students access financial aid through FAFSA, um, you know, monitoring the number of students who come into higher education and complete 24 credits within one year, and monitoring at the, at the end of the game as, as Dick said, how many of our graduates stay in our region? Right now, we know that 36% of the graduates of our public universities leave the state within uh, 12 months. So what can we do collectively to improve that? So reverting to the people that are already in the workforce who have some degrees, here is the stark statistic on Michigan. There are 1.4 million adults in Michigan who have some college but no degree. Um, they have student debt but nothing to show for it. Uh, upscaling and upskilling this cohort is perhaps the biggest opportunity that we have out of the norm to uh, do that, uh, to really reach our goal and to provide the business community with the workers that they need and they are advertising for and can't find. So the opportunity actually lies within our own organizations and what are we going to do? Stop complaining about the lack of educated people and actually get to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem and just asking about it. So this is the opportunity. And 49% of that 1.4 uh, million uh, cohort live in Southeast Michigan. So there is a big talent pool out there waiting for us to get behind the game. Why do we come to the business community? Well, number one, you know these people already, and it's easier to upskill somebody in your organization uh, and retain them to go out and get new talent. That's number one. But secondly, uh, and this statistic also surprised me, but the Lumina Foundation uh, has come up with a statistical basis that 63% of the post-secondary uh, spending and support is actually provided by the business community. Um, and that is a number that is really kind of sticks in my head. The other piece of that is that uh, employers who actually provide this support, very few actually 
track the return on investment. But as we saw in an opening slide in this presentation, I think it was in Bill's presentation, actually for every dollar that you spend uh, in supporting post-secondary education, the return on investment on average is $1.44. That's not bad. That's not bad. Um, so the opportunity is there for the business community to be a part of the solution by providing funding to support some additional schooling and also, if that's impossible, to provide the flexible scheduling to permit people to actually make classes as they are offered. So big opportunities for all of us in this room to be a part of this. And uh, we really want you to be part of it and to be members of the Detroit Compact as it goes forward. So what are we doing in this space uh, for adults, some college or some secondary, but no credential or degree? So you may remember that last year, at Mackinac, uh, President Wilson from Wayne State University announced the creation of the Warrior Way Back program. They were going to forgive debt for students who wanted to come back. Um, they forgave, uh, I think it was a total of $1,500. It was $500 per semester. They announced that here. Over the summer, they had a couple of information sessions. They had hundreds of people come back and learn more about that program. Over the last year, they've had over 100 people enroll in that program. So that was last uh, spring we announced it. Wayne State put it into action in the fall, but it was a catalyst for now a regional effort. So we were able to announce just last month the creation of the first regional um, higher education uh, debt forgiveness uh, collaborative that now includes Oakland University, Wayne State University, Wayne County Community College District, and Henry Ford College. So that's the higher ed pillar of this some college no degree. The next piece of this, if you want to go to the next slide, is pursuing public policies that support going after this group. Doug Gross is gonna talk a little bit about that when he comes up next. And then lastly, it's this education piece that, that business can support, and that'll be the subject really of our panel discussion that we're gonna get into. Uh, but there are ways the business community can, su can support this. Come and talk to us after the session and we'll talk about our compact and what business can do to help us reach this goal. I started at Wayne State University right out of high school, and as I developed my own career through internships and professional development, college kind of went by the wayside. I had some personal issues that I had to deal with when it came to family um, and also finances, and so therefore I left campus. My name is Shante Kane. I work at MGM Grand Detroit, and I've been there for 11 years. By utilizing tuition reimbursement, I've been able to go back, finish that degree in public relations, and pursue other opportunities within our large global corporation. Now, coming back to school 10 years later, it has allowed me to utilize my career experience within my classroom setting. As a mother of a four-year-old boy, I definitely want him to understand that education is key. And even though he's just starting his educational experience, I want him to see what the final product is, how great you can be when you set off to finish what you start. It is not always the easiest transition to move from student to employee to parent, um, but I try to make that circle go around as best as I can. By being a good employer, you are trying to attract great employees, not only for your loyalty, but also making sure that your product and services are beyond excellent for your clientele. And by having your company invest in their employees, by getting that education, there's nothing that a loyal employee won't do in order for their company to succeed. Not only do I have the support from my company, but also my immediate family. And one of those members was my fiance, Brandon, who was a great support system. He was my biggest cheerleader. He was my biggest encourager. He was holding my hand through the process of re-enrolling in school. We had plans, major plans for our future. And unfortunately, last year he passed away. Um, and I wanted to keep that promise to him, to make sure that I finished what we started, what we wanted to do, complete our plans. 
um, which is furthering both of our education. And with his memory and my four-year-old son by my side, I know that I can be successful in doing so and going further within the company um, with their support and reaching a new position. Please welcome Senior Advisor of Michigan Prosperity for the State of Michigan, Doug Ross. Well, thank you. I'm uh, delighted to have a chance to represent the governor's agenda here and first want to thank the chamber, which has been the real leader in this whole area of talent and West side of the state, Talent 2025, done a lot of similar things that really have paved the way for this administration's efforts. As you know, the governor has selected two top priorities at this point. One, which you've heard a lot about and will continue to hear about, is fix the damn roads. The other one is this, the skills gap. So, oh, I think I get to move them. Oh, it did move. Okay, great. Got it. The governor believes that the times have confronted her, the state, the administration, with three things that must get done if Michigan is indeed to be more prosperous and offer better opportunities for all its people. One is we need to build a modern physical and digital infrastructure Secondly, we have to increase the education attainment of our workforce dramatically. And third, ultimately, we need an internationally competitive K-12 system. And the one we want to talk about today is the middle one, education attainment. In the state of the state, as you know, she set a goal of six, similar to the Detroit Chamber, but for the entire state, of 60% attainment by 2030. Now, the reason for that is the belief that Michiganians are under-consuming learning required for prosperity. We simply aren't consuming enough skill. You saw this chart a minute ago for cities. This is the chart for states. It looks remarkably similar. It's a straight line, unless you have oil or gas deposits, between the percentage of your populace with college degrees and per capita income. And Michigan is down something like 32nd with roughly the same standing in terms of per capita income. The second reason is the skill gap that was talked about. It's estimated that by the middle of the decade, we will have more than a half million jobs requiring skills that we're going to need people to fill if businesses are going to be able to expand here and if we're, in fact, going to be able to grow. Remember the number, more than a half million. We'll get back to where we find them. Now, what's, what's the math? All right, right now, there are 5 million people in Michigan between 25 and 64. 1.6 million of them have bachelor's degrees, 500,000 have associate's degrees, 200,000, we think, some kind of certificates. 2.3 million, that's where the 45% comes from, because scale is important in all of 2030, because we're not projected to grow, in fact, our workforce is projected, unless we can change things, to contract some. We will still have roughly 5 million people in that age cohort. 60%, if we're going to get there to do the math, is 3 million. It's a gap of 700,000. Now, replacing the cohort now, which is 55 to 64, we don't want them to pass away, but they'll move out of our calculation. <laughs> and be replaced by 15 to 24-year-olds based on the attainment of the 25 to 34-year-olds, we will pick up about 250,000 of those credentials that we need. And if we can do better with completion rates and college going and so forth, maybe we can even squeeze another 50,000 out. But our challenge is 450,000 degrees credentials that, at this point, 
won't materialize if we maintain the status quo. Against that, more than a half million job openings that will require skills over the next, next half decade or so. Now, forget all the spigots in a way, but in a sense, I want you to focus on these two big tanks down at the bottom. We've got 2.65 million people, roughly, rough numbers to remember, 2.5 million people who have high school degrees or some college but have no credential. If we're going to pick up an extra 450, 400,000 in order to add to the 2.3 million we have now and the 250,000 we'll pick up from demographic change, it means we really are going to have to get something between 20 and 25 percent of adults who are currently in the workforce to acquire a credential. And if further, you assume the odds are that people over 50 will be doing less of it. Maybe that's an assumption we can change. So it's really 25 to 50 year olds. That group shrinks to a million and a half. So there are a million and a half 25 to 50 year olds without college degrees. And if we're to hit this, we need to get something like 400,000 of them to acquire credentials. So what becomes clear from all of this is this is an unprecedented kind of challenge for the, for the state, for the regions, because nobody we can find in the country or the world for that matter has been able, in the face of skill shortage and a non-expanding workforce, to be able to, to enable that many adults to acquire degrees or certificates. So we have to be inventive. Step one, governor believes the first thing we have to do is enact Michigan Opportunity and reconnect proposals. Michigan Opportunity is Michigan's version of the Tennessee Promise. Governor decided to take what were two really business design proposals for increasing uh, credentials in a state, and also we'll talk in a second about changing from Tennessee. So my opportunity and reconnect is the one, my opportunity is the one that would provide tuition-free community college for everyone graduating from high school. Reconnect would offer anybody over 25 without a college degree the opportunity to also have tuition-free access to college. Now, opportunity, as I said, is based on the Tennessee promise. It's last dollar, you have to apply for federal FAFSA uh, Pell Grants first. And you have responsibility, you have to get in the game, you have to maintain uh, your grades, you have to take something approaching a full load, you can't stop out or drop out, this is serious, you've gotta come in and complete within three years. You also, I'll come around, it's easier for me to see it here, we, we believe based on, there are now something like 11 other states with this, that it will significantly increase those entering post-secondary. Very importantly is the culture message. It essentially says we no longer stop at high school, that a high school degree is no longer enough if you aspire to a living wage with which you can support a family. And depends on, you can talk about it in some cases when there are no college people around as moving from a K-12 to a K-14. Or when you have college people in the room, you talk about basically going to a K to college system. But it changes the discussion. The way you change culture is you change the conversation. This changes the conversation around the kitchen table. It's not about can we afford it? Are you going to go on? The notion is, of course you're going to go on. Where are you going to go? What are you going to study? What are the possibilities? So I can't overemphasize that point. And in addition, it offers my opportunity, goes beyond the Tennessee promise, and offers students who are going to four-year colleges scholarships of 2,500 a year for the first two years if they graduated with at least a three-point and have a family income of other under uh, $80,000. Michigan Reconnect, as I said, 25 and older, also last dollar. 
you have to be attending half time because we're assuming you may have a job and family. And we think given the fact that we have to now educate so many adults at levels we've never had to before, that it's a potential game changer. Step two really goes to what uh, and uh, Greg were talking about. We need to engage the business community in new ways. We have to get, talk to four-year colleges about the adult market. Some of them are in it partially, but many not, still have traditional notions of most of their students being young people coming out of high school who are going to go for a few years and then move on. Uh, also, we've got to begin to put more focus on immigrants. With an aggressive policy to attract immigrants with college degrees here and keep our international students, we may be able to account for as much as 100,000 of that 400,000. 60% of the immigrants who've come to Michigan since 2010 have bachelor or graduate degrees. That's a, that's a huge amount. So bottom line, take away from all of this, top of what you just heard is, if we don't do this, there's no way we can succeed economically as a state. There's no way we can offer a growing number of our citizens a path to a living wage and income. And there's no way we can do this unless we figure out with the business community, with higher ed, how we're going to engage a very large percentage of our adults, current working adults, in going back and acquiring more formal education. That's the governor's priority. We're committed to doing it. We're looking forward to working with this region as leaders to make it happen. Thank you. Joining Doug Ross on stage is Chief Policy and Strategy Officer for the Tennessee Higher Education Commission, Emily House. <laughs> Vice President of Training and Development for Discover Financial Services, John Kaplan. Vice President of Talent Development at Quicken Loans, Kamari Yuel. And to moderate the discussion, host of Detroit. And Ingrid Jocks. Hello. Greetings to all of you. And um, hopefully, those of you who are hoping to see Steve Henderson aren't too disappointed that I'm here. <laughs> but this is a subject that's very important <coughs> to me. So we have some real experts on the matter here. So uh, Emily, I wanted to start with you since uh, the last few years in Michigan, it seems like Tennessee keeps coming up over and over when it comes to both K-12 reform and higher ed. And I know you're very involved in the latter. And I was hoping you could just uh, open up with some background to the programs in Tennessee that Michigan is, is striving to model after. Um, what was the business involvement in getting those programs off the ground. Sure. So thank you for the invitation to be here again. This is always such a privilege to come tell the Tennessee story, especially in a beautiful locale with all of you beautiful people like this. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, so we also in Tennessee have a statewide education, post-secondary educational attainment goal, a 55% goal, um, that I won't spend too much time talking about the goal itself, but that served really as an umbrella um, in a way I think that 60 by 30 could in Michigan for all of the higher education initiatives that happened under former Governor Haslam's uh, leadership and on his watch. So um, I'll speak very briefly about both of these programs and I'm happy to talk to anybody offline um, who would find any additional information helpful. But um, something that's important to note about the Tennessee Promise, which is comparable to the Michigan Opportunity Grant, is that it was a local program before it was a statewide program. So that program expanded from one county to 27 to all of Tennessee's 95 counties in 2014. Um, the first class that was treated by that program at the state level was the high school class of 2015. So we are four years in um, to the program for students of traditional age, which I know is a term that has fallen out of favor, so I will stop using it. Um, students right out of high school. 
And in 2017, legislation was signed to enact the ReConnect program, the Tennessee ReConnect program, which is for students who are effectively 25 and older, but technically it's those who file as independents on the FAFSA. Um, they are required to enroll half time, but other than that, it's very similar to the model of Tennessee Promise, just targeted a little bit more for adults. Um, that program launched in fall of 18 um, in response to, um, I won't spend time going through the math, but very similar to what Doug just presented about Michigan, that is the case in Tennessee as well, that we have a substantial population of adults with some college no degree, and mathematically we cannot get to 55% mm -hmm. thinking only about those students in high school. So when we think about the public good of higher education in Tennessee, it was very um, imperative to get the state where they needed to be to engage with adults to say nothing of the private good of the, the life-changingness of higher ed that we just saw in these vignettes on, on video. Okay, um, just as a quick follow-up, could you tell us a little bit about the, um, some of the successes that you've seen specifically through these two programs sure. and maybe some of the challenges um, that have arisen? Oh, absolutely, and you did ask about the involvement of the business community, yes. and I will say just very briefly that higher education is often very good at calling meetings of other higher education people. And I think for perhaps the first, that is, that is a Mike Krause line that I stole because he is not here. So if anybody knows Mike, that is his line. Um, so I think for the first time maybe ever at the launch of these programs, we were very intentional, Governor Haslam staff, the THEC staff, in engaging with employers in a very direct way. What do you need? What are you seeing? How can higher ed be a partner to meet the needs of your, um, the staff that you're hoping to build? Um, so in terms of the early successes of these programs, the successes of ReConnect are much more early than those of Promise. But related to Promise, the FAFSA filing rate has gone up in the state as students are required to file the FAFSA to be Promise eligible. We have over 80% of high school seniors filing the FAFSA in Tennessee. We are neck and neck with Louisiana for being number one in the country for FAFSA filing. I'll just go ahead and say we're number one with all, all respect to anybody who might be here from Louisiana. Thank you, sir. Um, so we have seen huge increases in FAFSA filing. The first year in which Promise was implemented, we saw a six percentage point jump in the college going rate. So about 57% of seniors were enrolling seamlessly into college. That number jumped to about 63% from 2014 to 2015. So that was really reflective of the shock to the system that was Promise. Promise students persist at higher rates than their peers. They have graduated um, at higher rates than their non-Promise peers. We have, it, with our community colleges in Tennessee, we have very, um, we have issues that are very common nationwide with regard to community college infrastructure and the population who enrolls and the services provided to them. So by no means is this a miracle cure for anything related to the community college environment, but it has been a wonderful um, success. And then very quickly about ReConnect, um, I'm happy to tell this story over at the stables later tonight, but the short story is that we anticipated about eight to 10,000 adults would take advantage of ReConnect. The economy in Tennessee is very strong. Unemployment is very low. So when we wrote up the proposal, I'm, I take responsibility or credit, in this case responsibility, for the fiscal note that was presented to legislators that was way off, way off, because we thought about eight to 10,000 adults would take part, 35,000 adults signed up for ReConnect and about 15,000 of them enrolled, 75% of them persisted term to term fall to spring this past year. So the take up and the interest has just been beyond um, our wildest dreams, which is a success in and of itself. Yeah, thank you. So speaking of business involvement, um, John, I wanted to turn to you. If you could talk a little bit about what Discover has done. I understand um, it's a pretty robust program for educational benefits for your employees. So if you could just lay out briefly what, what those are and, and how it's going. Sure, so in, um, in uh, truth in advertising, uh, Discover does not have operations in Michigan. We, have, we employ no one, so far as I know, in Michigan. Uh, I think what I'm here to do is talk about how a company can use education assistance to uh, increase degree attainment, and we're just, um, we're just two states over in Illinois. So, um, uh, we, you know, d Discover, uh, you know, we, we really, uh, the, our, our business really revolves around having uh, great customer service uh, and having great talent, uh, and I think it's, it's also basically a brand business. I'm sorry, is this working? Do you want to get Should we try the microphone no. or? 
All right, we'll, 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 we'll struggle along with this and see if, see if this, uh, this works. I think if I, it, it depends on how I move. I'm going to stay <laughs> very, very still while I talk. Fine so, work. You can't move. You fine. OK, I can, we'll put this down here, and I'll just stay very still. Uh, so you know, our, our goals are really around talent acquisition and retention uh, and skill development and building brand. And so you know, when we looked at how could we do those things, uh, we had this uh, tuition assistance program that, uh, that we've had at the company for as long as any, anyone can remember. Uh, and um, I actually had an opportunity to meet the people from the Lumina Foundation. You'll see there, there was, in both of those videos, there was this, um, a stat quoted at the end around uh, the ROI of tuition reimbursement programs. That actually came from Discover. Uh, and I managed to get the, the Lumina Foundation people to come into Discover and to do a top to bottom ROI analysis on our tuition reimbursement program. And what they found out is using very, very uh, conservative benchmarks that every dollar that we invested in tuition reimbursement returned that dollar plus another dollar 44 in profit. And the profit really had to do with uh, talent, uh, talent retention, so we had lower attrition, uh, it had, we had lower absenteeism, we had uh, people promoted into higher skilled jobs faster, and we had people transitioned into higher skilled jobs faster. And it didn't actually look at the performance of the employees. Could you get anything more out of them? It just looked at just very basic, very conservative factors. And what we did is we took that to our executive committee, our, our CEO and our chief financial officer, et cetera, and we said, look, you know, this, this, uh, this shows that this is a program that warrants more investment. And I think if we're smart about our tuition reimbursement program, we can use it to actually drive increased talent acquisition. So who wants to, who wants to come to Discover and earn a bachelor's degree? Uh, we can use it to continue to retain talent. Uh, we can use it to uh, build skills. And if we're really clever about the way we roll it out, we can use it to burnish uh, the Discover brand. And all those things have happened. I mean, we've um, our, our program now we have 500 people that are enrolled uh, getting college degrees. We offer now the Discover College Commitment is uh, we pay 100% of tuition, um, required fees, books, supplies, um, and uh, we even provide a tax gross up if people have a tax liability at the end of the year. So we have 500 people uh, enrolled in the program. You can qualify for the program on day one of employment. Uh, and it's really what we see is we see we're acquiring better talent, we're retaining people, uh, we're, we're building skills, and we've gotten a nice little bounce in, in our brand because uh, the, the program was so well reported in, uh, in the national media. Um. of the program to stay with the company for a certain amount of time? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So um, actually, I've been advocating at Discover that we get rid of the, uh, that we have a clawback agreement. If you leave the company, um, <laughs> you have to pay back everything that we paid, uh, that we spent on your behalf over the previous 24 months. And uh, for, for, I think for three or four years, I've been saying we should get out of this business. We don't want to be in the business of collecting money from a 24-year-old who leaves Discover. And the, the brand of, of being able to say it's a no-strings-attached degree, I mean, that, I thought that warranted it. Um, it. That alone, I mean, it'll help you acquire better talent. Interestingly enough, just uh, the week before I think we launched, uh, my CEO looked at me and said, why do we have this, this clawback agreement? I said, you know, that's, that's a really good question. I've been telling everyone we should get rid of it. And he said, you should get rid of it. And at the last minute, I, I blinked and I said, I'm actually, I thought to myself, I'm, I just didn't want the program to grow from zero to 2,500 people and then crash as a lot of people left the company. Uh, you know, and I thought that would compromise the overall program. So I think it's on the roadmap. It's something we're going to get rid of. And I think it actually is, is something that we can use uh, to advertise more for employees. <coughs> Our applications up quite a bit, or yeah. Sorry. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, so Discover's uh, we run big call centers in the United States. Uh, we have about 7,500 call center employees. Uh, call centers, on average, they probably have a 50% attrition rate. Um, no one can remember a time in which we um, Discover has had lower attrition in our call centers, and to a large extent, this is because we provide these kind of benefits. We're also getting a higher caliber candidate. Interestingly enough, um, uh, we were trying to close a, a senior vice president of analytics, uh, 
uh, right when this program rolled out. Uh, obviously, this gentleman had plenty of degrees. He didn't need a bachelor's degree. Uh, but uh, when the program rolled out and he read about it, he uh, called up the three other companies that he was interviewing with, and he said, I'm not interested in coming. He called us and said, I'd like to come work for you, because if that's the way you treat your frontline employees, that's the kind of company I want to work for. So, Kamari, could you tell us a little bit about what Wiccan is doing in, uh, in Detroit, specifically? and maybe beyond. I know. Just narrow it. Yeah, I know there's a lot of, uh, between you know, both the high school level, Quigan's gotten involved, and, um, but also just in training its employees. So I know there's a lot going on. But could you just maybe hit some of the highlights of what, uh, of what your work is? Sure. So at Quicken, we, oh, there is so much that we're doing. Yeah, I know. Um, we do a lot of internships. Um, when we speak about post-secondary and who we bring in, um, at last count of the last six years, we have brought in about 9,000 interns, and about 36% of those interns have converted. And when we look at the conversion of those interns, about 10% of our population right now um, come from internships, and 8% of our leaders, our frontline leaders, were at one point interns. And the reason that I bring that up is because the way that we look at development is not just what happens inside of a classroom, but we also understand the importance of what happens inside of a classroom. Hmm. And so as an organization, it's how do we tap into the foundation that's been laid and build upon that. And so we provide tuition assistance for our, for our team members from day one. So the very first day coming in, if you want to take advantage of um, either getting a certificate, a certification, a two-year degree or four-year degree, um, you're able to do that. And we max out at the 5250 for all of our team members. And what we're seeing is that team members want to take advantage of that. Um, however, there's been a challenge of, you just talked about it earlier, of attending the brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. And so last year, um, we introduced a program where we partnered with online universities and we saw about 17% of our team members that we opened this up to um, took advantage of that. And so some of those were micromasters, um, cert certifications from colleges. And I think it is about how are we being innovative and identif identifying how are we as an organization going to decrease the skill gaps within our own organization. Mm -hmm. But also we come from the mindset of we have a family of companies. Mm -hmm. And when we think about attracting talent and retaining that talent, um, we use the saying of one family, many careers. And so one of the things I think we do well is providing opportunity for our team members. You could start off in banking, but you could end up at StockX working in the stock market of things. And so it's how do we paint this picture and this vision for our team members who are coming in of this opportunity that exists in Detroit when other folks were saying there was no opportunity in Detroit. And so we're consistently seeing more and more team members internally take advantage of the opportunities because what they're seeing is that there's a direct correlation of their ability to navigate through the organization by developing their skills. Is there one employee that's taken advantage of a program within the family of companies that stands out? So one employee that stands out to me, so we have a program that's internal. We've partnered with Grand Circus. Um, if you're not familiar with Grand Circus, you can still come see me afterwards. And it's a boot camp where team members who are not in technology um, learn C, uh, C Sharp as well as um, other coding and, and development skill sets. And this one particular team member actually uh, received her accounting degree from Wayne State came in as an intern, um, did that for a little bit of time, working in our servicing department, and identified that there were some opportunities and she wanted to learn SQL. So she taught herself how to do this so that she could create code um, to make her job a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And from that, she then determined that she wanted to do more than accounting. And so when we rolled out this dev build uh, program, she signed up for this. And upon her signing up, it's a six, it's a 16 week program. Um, she went through the program, she completed the program, 
And she is now um, working as a business analyst within our product strategy team um, that's leading up our lending transformation that we're doing internally. And so I think that's a, a story of a team member taking ownership of an opportunity um, that's being presented by the organization, but also owning that and saying, this is where I want to go. How do I get there? And I mentor Angelica, and I, I will tell you, um, I started mentoring her about two years ago, and seeing her today in this new role, thriving and really understanding how she's impacting the, in the outcome of the organization is just phenomenal. Hmm. That's really great. And I can imagine, uh, John, you touched on this too, but uh, with programs like this and the kind of investment you're making, not just in employees, but in, in these indiv individuals and their opportunities. It just seems like that's really building, would build strong employee loyalty. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, the, the loyalty that we, we get um, out of a program like this, um, it, it's just, uh, we actually notice it. We do annual em employee engagement surveys and uh, we noticed it right away in the data that, that came out right after we announced this. Uh, when we, we announced this at a at an all hands meeting, we have a uh, five thousand people in a room, and, and uh, we announced it. Um, and they, they take question, they do Q and A afterwards. And I think the first, you know, four or five questions, people would uh, people would stand up and say, uh, I don't have a question. I just think it's great that we're investing in in people's college education, and they'd sit back down. And we had sort of five people in a row who said a variant of something like that. You know, one, the chief counsel said to me early on, said the the beauty of this program is that it probably directly impacts, you know, 4%, uh, maybe 5% of the company, but everyone feels it. Everyone feels like this is, this is a place I can be proud of working. And I think that just, uh, it translates to, uh, to higher retention, it, it translates to higher engagement across the entire company. Hmm. So Doug, you hit on some of these things in your uh, intro. But with the work that you're doing and from your perspective, how do you see kind of all these different pieces coming together from, you know, whether it's step forgiveness, employee or employer involvement, um, you know, state policy, how, how do these things all come together to really move a state forward? Well, it, it's pretty clear when you look at all the data that doing what we're doing a little better isn't going to get us there. And so part goes back again to this issue of culture. You know, Peter Drucker famously said, uh, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, our programs are important, but what we tell ourselves, what we tell our children about how the world works and what it takes to be successful ultimately counts for more, which is one of the reasons the governor chose to kind of turbocharge this 60 by 30 with reconnect and my opportunity because they're really, they change the expectation. The other thing is working with college leaders, business leaders, government, we've got to develop, I think, a next generation of education products. In many cases that are designed for people who are currently working, that offer convenient, ways that are increasingly expected so that much like you know the the fitness industry has worked to create all kinds of ways for us to work it in and so forth this becomes uh, you know as important as maintaining our uh, our uh, our physical health so to me this is all about the debt forgiveness uh, companies offering different kinds of learning incentives are all part of this process. The, the key, though, is there's an urgency. We're in a world that's not waiting for us to figure it out. Unless we can really up this, and that's what the governor's trying to do by saying, I've got two priorities. This is one of them. It's not partisan. Let's get going. But uh, just as a follow-up in, in your presentation, I mean, you hit on and Michigan's dual challenges within education with both the, um, the college attainment, you know, uh, cred credential attainment, uh, but also the issues facing K-12 and the need to really boost learning there. And could you just talk a little bit about how, um, I mean, is it a bit putting the cart before the horse maybe to be focusing on 
what kids can do after they graduate while we still have this pretty glaring problem? Right. It's a good question, but it's almost like the, uh, the uh, do we focus on, on you know, occupational certificates or college degrees? We have to do both. Look, I mean, one of the things the governor's focused on in her budget is uh, early literacy. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of evidence to say that early literacy really matters. But if we're talking about six-year-olds right now and making sure by the time they're eight they can really read, six-year-olds don't really come into our economy in any meaningful way for 20 years. So we got to deal with the hand we have been dealt through our K-12 sure. system and so sure. forth while concomitantly committing ourselves to improving that, that product. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Emily, I want to come back to you. I know um, my understanding with what Tennessee is doing in, in, uh, in higher ed, uh, Tennessee has a very robust grant program for you know, both community college and four-year colleges. Could you touch a little bit on how that all plays together in, in Tennessee? Sure. So um, a, a few things to, to respond to from the other panelists as well. I actually was an intern at TEC 12 oh. years ago, so I am all for the, <laughs> the getting the interns bought in. Um, as well as these, these points that we're making about culture, both in the corporate environment as well as from the policy perspective, the, the culture that has been built in Tennessee around college going and around college access is definitely not as quantifiable as what I mentioned earlier about FAFSA filing and college going, but it is palpable when you go into those high schools. The conversation has changed completely in many of these high schools from am I going to college to where I'm going to college, as well as this inclusivity about what it means to go to college. So there's no conversation any longer in Tennessee in the main, right? There are pockets, but in the main about like, well, should I go to a trade school or should I go to college? Like everything you do after high school is post-secondary and all of those things are post-secondary. So I think that's been very powerful in Tennessee. So to the point about the grant programs themselves, so Promise and Reconnect are both last dollar scholarships for students attending community colleges or technical colleges. Um, they do not include the universities except for the handful of universities that have associate degree programs. Um, so they are really focused on the less than four year sector. Um, the average last dollar award for a Promise student is about $1,000. The same is true for a Reconnect student as well. Something that we've run into thinking about the adult learners and the Reconnect program that I don't have a great response to. If anybody else does, I welcome your feedback after the panel. Um, we have encountered many adults who have, for a variety of reasons, either exhausted their federal grant eligibility, they've exhausted their federal financial aid, or they are in default and therefore cannot access their federal financial aid. So the costs for Reconnect have actually been a bit higher overall um, due to the increased take up as well as due to um, some of these uh, eligibility issues that we've run into. So we, that is our, our most immediate challenge related to the grant piece of both of these programs, particularly for the, the adult students, not really for those who are just out of high school. Um, we have a very robust financial aid system at the state level that does include the universities. We do have a HOPE scholarship program, um, which we can you know, discuss offline, the positives and the negatives of merit aid. Um, those are true in Tennessee as well as other states, the, both the plus and the minus of programs like that. But we do have a very robust HOPE scholarship. It's about $360 million a year. Um, many of those recipients do go to universities. We have state need-based grant aid um, as well as for all students, public and private institutions alike, as well as these two programs that are very much targeted, Promise and Reconnect, to the less than four-year sector. Thanks. Um, I also want to make sure that if any of you all have a question, we can get to you. I think there's a microphone floating out there somewhere, but are there any questions from? I think I may have the microphone. No one? <laughs> Here it comes. Here the microphone. I wanted to ask Emily, these reforms in Tennessee were started under Governor Haslam. You've had political leadership change there. Has, have the, were the reforms sustained? And what's the challenge of sustaining a culture of reform through political leadership change? That's a great question. So we have been very fortunate in Tennessee because even prior to Governor Haslam's eight years, Governor Bredesen 
in the eight years prior was very education and higher education focused as well. So um, our new governor, Governor Bill Lee, um, is not even six months into his uh, term, his first term. Um, his priorities are different, but I don't think they are in contrast to the priorities of the two men that preceded him. Um, and by that, I mean he is oriented a bit more around career and technical education, particularly in terms of, and for, so on the K-12 side, with regard to dual enrollment opportunities, CTE coursework in the high schools, as well as the post-secondary coursework offered at our technical colleges in Tennessee. Um, I think the momentum will sustain, will be sustained, um, irrespective of, so we've also had about a third of our legislature turnover. So our legislature is supermajority Republican, it remains supermajority Republican, but some of the personnel is different now by about a third. I think even as there is this natural change in priority that's going to come from this new leadership, I think the momentum will sustain. I think it has become so much part of the work in this space very broadly. So, I mean, THAC, we eat, sleep, and breathe all of this as well, but also the K-12 space is engaged, the nonprofit space, the business community is engaged. So it's not really that Haslam is no longer in office and now we all like slam on the brakes, which I'm, I'm very grateful for. Anything else for now? Or? Uh, this is for Emily. I'm curious, if you could do it all over again, would you do anything differently about how you've rolled out um, the promise and uh, Tennessee Reconnect? So I think um, this is a last dollar program. I think in a world of unicorns and puppy dogs and unending funding, there could be opportunities that are not last dollar. Um, I think there are opportunities for non-tuition costs. And I think that is an avenue that we will explore um, either at the state level or through philanthropy or through some kind of other vehicle. Um, thinking about microgrants, um, you know, the student who gets a flat tire and can no longer come to class. I think there's opportunity there. I think we were very fortunate, um, as I mentioned previously, this was a local program that diffused to a region that then diffused statewide. So we saw some of the best practices, we saw some of the successes. Um, because for all intents and purposes, Tennessee Promise as a statewide initiative is virtually identical to what it was in Knox County, Tennessee, when it was just one county. Um, so I think that was an advantage as well. Uh, that was an advantage as all of this was implemented about five years ago. I think the advantage for ReConnect, um, implemented much more recently, was the success of a previous program. A lot of the feedback that we got when implementing Promise was, well, what about adults? Like from the legislature, there was a lot of, I have adults in my district who could benefit from this as well, what about them? So I think the, the open communication was a benefit. I think the, the prior experience and the prior successes were a benefit. I think in terms of doing something over, again, in this world of unicorns and rainbows, I wish there were more funding. We have plenty of funding, but I wish the program were structured in a way that could be sustainable that would provide additional funding, because more money is always better in these cases. And I wanted to add that in Michigan, we've had that same regional learning, because in effect, the My Opportunity modeled very much on the Tennessee Promise, but really tested considerably by the Detroit Promise in, greater De in the city of Detroit. So we learned a lot about it. And of course, the work that they've been doing with uh, Henry Ford Community, well, a number of the community colleges to increase completion and so forth. So this in the same way kind of grew up from uh, local experimentation and local learning. I just wanted to jump in real quick. Uh, this would apply to both you, John, and, and Kamari. I mean, as um, you know, programs at the state level are, are being talked about and you know, I'm assuming ho hopefully rolled out in Michigan at, at some point. Would you see that changing what, do you see that changing what your companies would be offering employees or just um, in addition to the programs that you have in place to, to help employees with their education? So I would see it in addition to. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't see it taking the place. I see greater partnership with the state um, so that we can assist the, 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 um, the residents in, this, in, in the region. So I would think it would just enhance it um, but as I'm listening to Emily speak about, you know, last dollar, right. I start thinking about well, what are we as an organization as we start to move forward with these programs, how are we going to impact our team members in such a way that it, it doesn't create a greater burden on the state 
And it also creates an enhanced experience so that that team member can decrease their skill gaps and be able to move around the region in the way that they need to. Yeah, so I'll talk you know, from the micro perspective at Discover and then maybe from the macro perspective. Uh, from the micro perspective, I, I don't think that, uh, that state or local um, policies would change at all what Discover is doing. I mean, the, the truth is that these programs are, have such a high return that just from a business perspective, and from a business perspective alone, it makes so much sense to be doing this for your for your population. And so I got asked a lot of the question. We rolled this out uh, in May of last year, so it was right after the Tax Act. And there are a lot of questions that I got. You know, is this because of the tax rebate that companies have, have gotten with the new Tax Act? And the answer is no. We were going to do this regardless. Um, the fact that our balance sheet is healthier because of the Tax Act has nothing to do with whether or not you invest in workers. Now. Uh, the macro perspective is that if you can use state policy and local policy to, to just dial up the incentives for companies to, to undertake these programs, look, I, I believe these programs are, are enormously a, a, a beneficial to the company, but obviously not every company sees that right now. If you can turn up the incentives just a little bit, you might be able to get greater uptake on these programs for a lot of other companies, maybe smaller companies. Right now, the, the vast majority of companies that have these education assistance programs are larger companies, and smaller companies don't. And so is there a way that you can use uh, state policy to increase the incentives for small companies to create similar programs? So a long Along the lines of what uh, John just mentioned, there are a number of employers who have for years had employee assistance programs from a tuition assistance or reimbursement standpoint. Is there any, um, is there any data around the number of employees that activate those programs today? And from a pra very practical standpoint, uh, can you, either of you guys on the panel speak to what you've done, what your companies have done in order to enhance the number of employees that take advantage of those programs? Yes, yeah, so, so I'll talk a little bit about Discover. So w what we did is we spent several years looking at the barriers. Uh, we had only 3% of our employees participating in our education assistance program. And when you have a, a I, think, I think overall we had about 50% of our employees had, did not have a bachelor's degree. So, you know, why are only 3% of our employees participating in the program? And we started finding things like a reimbursement program is, is very, very difficult to employ who is making $35,000 a year. I mean, it's not uncommon to have to write a check to uh, a, a university of four to $5,000. And, and, and if, you know, who has, you know, 10 to 15% of their gross income that they can tie up um, waiting to get reimbursed? Uh, we looked at things like the absence of coaching, and the, the, one of the problems with people who don't have degrees, at least at Discover, is low self-efficacy rates. And what we found is, is that they would take an accounting class, they would fail the accounting class, and then they'd quit. Mm -hmm. uh, the, just that they, they had no concept that, well, this is something I can recover from. And so we put in place success coaching to help our employees rebound from, from, uh, you know, from disappointments like that. I mean, there are probably 15 different things that we looked at and we said, okay, here are the 15 different barriers. What can we do in each one of them? Uh, and I, I think we probably got to uh, six or seven that we implemented and maybe there are another few that, that are still on the table. But ultimately, I mean, I think actually the thought process is very, very similar. I mean, I was, I was listening to, to Emily about how do you think about what the barriers are in your population and how do you lift those barriers for the right, you know, for the, for the employees that have the most trouble getting back into college. This one's for Emily, and I'm, I'm uh, going back to the traditional student coming out of high school. And if I recall, Tennessee embarked on a very robust program to improve K-12 improvement. Um, and how linked is the success and some of the, uh, the uplift that you've gotten to higher performance in that K-12 system? And does, do we need to invest further there before we can have the same expectation? That's a great question. And so I can't speak really in detail about the K-12 side, but I do think that the links there 
um, between you know leadership all the way down to considering the different types of students have been pivotal in a lot of this. And when we think we, we so often talk about K-12 and higher ed without thinking about the continuum that is inherent in K-12 through higher ed. But I think there's been a lot of innovative policy as well as really good personnel to collaborate in that space. So we have um, been very strategic about early post-secondary opportunities, dual enrollment, AP, IB, all of that. There's actually a state grant program that subsidizes dual enrollment courses. Um, so that's just one example of being very strategic about um, remediation and developmental courses for those students coming out of high school, perhaps um, not quite ready either in math or in English or in both for post-secondary level work. Um, we've been creative there with regard to curriculum being delivered in the K-12 space that's actually post-secondary curricula, co-requisite remediation, all of that. So I think there's been, um, the short answer is yes, I think a lot of the success has benefited from the, the um, innovation and the policy and the program that has happened on the K-12 side, but what I can speak much more fluently to is what is happening in this like 10th grade through first year of college space, which is this innovation around remediation, um, EPSOs, early post-secondary opportunities and the like. Anything else? I had a question for probably both you, Doug, and, and Emily. Um, in offering, say, a free community college program, um, you know, even if it's part of a, a broader higher education push, I mean, clearly employers are looking for employees with a range of degrees from bachelor's you know, down to a credential. How do you keep, I mean, have you seen, is there a tilt too far to one type of degree when, when you start opening things up to a free, uh, a free type of degree, but maybe not across the board? Um, and, you know, are there, say, too many uh, associate's degrees coming out when maybe employers are looking for a four-year degree? I, I don't think so. That's a very fair question, and that's a very fair concern. I don't think we've really seen that thus far in Tennessee. I think perhaps some folks who, if anybody's tweeting, please don't tweet this. I think there are some <laughs> folks on the university side who feel a little bit left out of the conversation sometimes because the conversation has centered for these past few years and will likely continue to, um, given the interest of this current governor, kind of center around the less than four year sector. Mm -hmm. um, so I think some of those who are administrators or leaders of universities might feel a little bit differently, but I don't think we are, I don't think we've overcorrected in a way that is problematic for the, the workforce, for the opportunities throughout the state. I don't think that has happened yet, but that is something to, to perhaps keep an eye on. And it varies regionally as well. I mean, the, the workforce needs vary regionally. The degrees produced regionally vary. And for the most part, those are aligned enough that has not risen up to the level of problematic. There's been that discussion around the legislation, should it, mm -hmm. uh, limit, for example, uh, tuition-free access to certain kinds of mm -hmm. degrees or whatever. And uh, one, one piece of that, of course, is we have a terrible record of predicting what's going to be, so you have to start with a lot of humility that we, we are no good at it. Uh, secondly, I think the experience with Fourier is there's a tremendous, I mean, if we went around the room, there may be a few computer scientists here, mm -hmm. but I bet there are a lot of political science, history, economics, and so forth, and we've all somehow made a living. English. Uh, <laughs> yeah, English, there you go. Well, at least you're a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> that, that follows. Um, so secondly, and when it comes down to the occupational certificates and so forth, the local business communities have been pretty good at interacting with community colleges to begin to communicate what's in demand, and I would expect this would uh, accelerate that, intensify it. So I, and then there's a the little bit, uh, Ingrid, of my libertarian background that leads me to think we shouldn't tell people probably too much what they ought to do and let them pick it. And I think too, just very pragmatically, so not from a libertarian standpoint, from a very like pragmatic like communications perspective, something that's been very successful in Tennessee that some of you have probably heard me say before is the simplicity of messaging. We don't really get into the nuances related to, well, you gotta file your FAFSA and you gotta meet with your mentor and then you get your Pell Grant and then you get your other aid and then we'll top you off and then it's free. Right, so anybody who looks below the surface will get that information, but in terms of messaging, free college, you're going to college, it's free, ready, go. And I think the more you put on it related to, well, you can pursue this field, but not this field, 
or these types of credentials or these um, occupations or credentials that lead to these occupations that are in high demand, the more of that you do, the more diluted the message can become. Right. And the reason for going for universality rather than means testing is one that scholarships don't change the culture in that same way because the me and, and uh, so that was an important reason. And the second is when it's universal to the question that Nolan asked, uh, it's much more likely to be uh, sustained politically. Because it, it, and it doesn't feel like it's kind of welfare or it's less earned or you're less deserving. It's something, it's like high school. Sure. We provide high school tuition free for everybody because the community needs it and you need it for your own future. We're really now saying community college and as a path to four year, everybody needs that now. One thing I've spent, um um, an enormous amount of time over the past five years um, working with people in higher ed. And I would say that four-year universities actually love the model where you can take people and create pathways out of, out of community colleges. Because the, 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 the success rate of someone who has two years of community college before they go to a four-year college is much, much higher. And so I think the, the, the really forward-looking deans and provosts are trying to figure out how can we build really good relationships with the, the most successful community colleges because that allows us to play to our strengths, especially research t tier one universities. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from out here? I don't want to miss anybody. Um, Emily, I was wondering, do you track the folks that go through the Promise program, like how many might go on? to a four-year degree? I mean, is, is that something that's encouraged at the state level? Yeah, so that is encouraged at the state level. Um, back in 2010, the Complete College Tennessee Act actually um, put into statute 43 or 45 transfer pathways. So what you just described is actually in statute, in the, the code okay. in the state of Tennessee, that if you do these particular courses at community colleges, you can transfer seamlessly to these particular programs at um, all but one, I think, public university in the state. So there has been uh, a policy and a programmatic emphasis on that. What we are seeing with the Promise students is actually not quite as much transfer as we anticipated. I think because um, Promise operates really on two margins. The student who wasn't gonna go to college and went anyway, which is the majority, or the student who was gonna to go to a four year and downshifted with the intention of transferring or not to a two year. We saw so many more, just kind of statistically, predictively, of that, the former, that the, it's the ones who weren't gonna to go to school anyway who have now been incented to go. So transfer is absolutely encouraged, but it's not really like the forefront of conversations about promise because of who we see taking up the program. Okay. Well, I think we're kind of running out of time here, but thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you. Good thank you for stepping in. Please welcome back to the stage Richard Russell. So very briefly, I want to thank everybody for coming out today, but I especially want to thank our panelists. I want to thank Bill Moses for making this session possible and so on. It's quite clear to me and I hope to you that the programs that we're talking about are the most cost effective way for a lot of businesses to upscale their workforce and to retain and attract. So that is just really crystal clear for me today. Looking forward, as we go forward with the Detroit Degrees Program, our regional compact, look forward to this summer to receiving a survey that will kind of ask your business, what are you doing, what are you willing to do, and we are going to roll up those results as we launch the compact in this fall. So. This is an ongoing effort. We do need to engage you in the business community as well as the ed educational community, or we are not going to achieve our results. Again, thank you all for coming out today. Thank you, our panelists. I think they were outstanding. Thanks very much. <laughs>